Listen to a knock knock joke from the afterlife. Learn why you should never play with matches or ghosts. Lose sleep when your mom invites a ghost to live with you. All this and more to distress, disquiet, and discombobulate. It's totally true. It's told by you. It's this week's ghoulish glug of odd tonic. Welcome to the parlor. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Maxwell. The tea is poured, so have a seat, dear guest. Your favorite spot is waiting for you. (laughs) The cushion has a permanent guest-shaped outline in it now. We're about to embark on another edition of Parlor Stories, tales of the strange and unexplained, submitted from guests just like you. And these accounts came from people who are not only guests, but also oddlings, Mm. members of our Odd Tonic group on Facebook. They have shared four amazing stories that we cannot wait to read to you. Mm -mm. But before we begin, may I disclose, my love, Mm. just how much I am enjoying our Odd Tonic group. Yes. It's filled with people who are wonderfully warm and sharp and funny. (laughs) And on a daily basis, they are helping us curate a kind of a visual supplement of the Odd Tonic podcast. Mm. They're presenting more weird history and science Mm. and paranormal topics captured in interesting articles Mm -hmm. and um, arresting art and hilarious memes. (laughs) I love the camaraderie that's gelled in the group. We have the most supportive weirdos around. (laughs) (laughs) We really do. Particularly because I think there's a lot of shared experiences, Mm -hmm. including unexplained encounters that they might be hesitant to mention within other groups. Yeah, absolutely. And we encourage you to join the Odd Tonic group if you haven't already. Just head on over to facebook.com slash Odd Tonic Society and click on the big blue visit group button. (laughs) Share with the group your unexplained encounter or better yet, send it to us and we'll bring it to life in a future episode. Send it to theparlor at oddtonicsociety.com. In the meantime, we're going to dive into the latest batch of strange true tales to become part of the Parlor Stories collection. Tonight, we'll meet a woman who learned the danger of ghosts taking a joke too seriously. And we'll learn that a family that laughs together haunts together. But first, a frightful tale guaranteed to haunt you for days. It comes to us from Heather about her imaginary friend who wasn't so imaginary. When I was just a little girl, I spent a lot of time in my maternal grandparents' house in Dunkerton, Iowa. My grandpa had built on property, we later learned, that had been the site of a funny farm before it was destroyed in a fire set by one of the workers. Funny farms were actual farms where people who were mentally and emotionally ill were sent to work in exchange for room and board as a means of cheap labor. This was a common practice in the late 1800s to early 1900s, but few official records of these places remain today. Back then, those kinds of disabilities were severely misunderstood, and the workers were often mistreated and neglected by staff members. So, there were some very unhappy souls lurking about my grandparents' property, probably including my Aunt Sherry. My grandparents had five children total, My half-aunt, who was from my grandma's previous marriage, was the oldest. Then came Larry, then Jerry. Both boys died within a few days of being born, most likely from SIDS, as they were both healthy when they left the hospital. Sherry was born after them. There were a lot of complications during her birth, leaving her with severe brain damage that rendered her unable to speak or communicate, outside of unintelligible grunts and growls and the occasional violent outburst. She did learn to walk, despite what doctors predicted for her, but she died of spinal meningitis when she was 11 years old. I believe Sherry would pinch both me and my younger brother when we were little. 
My grandpa would always laugh it off and say it was just Happy the ghost. But I am sure I heard multiple times the two infant sons crying at night, even though it was decades after they passed away. Anyway, I had what my grandparents and my parents thought was an imaginary friend from the day I started speaking intelligibly enough to be understood until I was about eight years old. Her name was Caroline, and I would play with her on the sun porch almost every day. I remember Caroline being around 12 or 13 years old. She had shoulder-length dirty blonde hair. It was always a bit untidy, like no one ever told her to brush it. She usually wore a white floral print dress that went past her knees, and she was pale, like she didn't really go outside like a normal kid did. I only ever saw her on the sun porch, but she went everywhere in the house. She always knew what I had been doing and what I said. She even knew stuff about my grandparents sometimes, like she told me where my grandpa hid our piggy bank once. She always wanted to play dolls, and her doll always wanted to do bad things. She made me melt my first Ken doll. Then we had to use teddy bears as boys, and she liked this little panda with red eyes. He was the king of everything, and he tortured the others, except for my favorite, who we agreed would be his prisoner bride. She didn't want my doll to love him. She wanted her to be stuck with him forever and to always be sad. Really weird games for a kid that young to play. As time went by, the adults in my life started noticing two rather odd things. One, they started finding matches that had been struck and blown out in the areas of the house that I played in. There was no way I could have reached where my grandpa kept the matches, and the box was always in the same place whenever he looked. Two, I was starting to act like I was both upset with and fearful of Caroline. I no longer wanted to play on the porch alone, and I could be heard telling her, stop that, and go away, and I don't like you anymore, pretty frequently when they listened in on my playtime. I remember basically throwing a tantrum when I was seven around Easter time. I told her I hated her. She was the one playing with the matches, and I was the one getting blamed. Soon, I stopped wanting to go to my grandparents' house altogether, and I would beg my mom to take me to my paternal grandparents' house instead, which was odd because I absolutely loved spending time with them. The last interaction I had with Caroline was later that same year, when I was eight. It was late at night, around Christmas time. I was reading in bed, and everyone else was asleep. She appeared in the doorway, completely engulfed in flames, the tips of her hair weightless in the orange and violet fire. She was laughing maniacally, yet silently, reaching toward me with both hands as she drifted forward, excruciatingly slowly, floating a few inches above the floor. I remember screaming bloody murder, and suddenly, everything went black. Before I woke up to my grandpa standing over me, with a very concerned look on his face, I must have fainted from shock. That was the last time I saw her. <laughs> Yikes! <sighs> well... Hmm. It's always a little sad to see a friendship go up in flames. <laughs> well played. Wow, this is perhaps one of the spookiest and most cinematic ghost stories we've shared. Oh, that end visual really is just totally burned into my brain. <laughs> As it were. I know, it's completely terrifying, oh. right? Mm. I have never fainted, mm. but I have no doubt that if Caroline came at me, Hands outstretched, <laughs> laughing, floating. On fire. And on fire. Yeah, I'd be out too. 
forever. <laughs> Heather, thank you for sharing this experience and rest knowing that all of our listeners will receive just as little sleep as you did that <laughs> night uh, so many years ago. <laughs> Speaking of imaginary friends, our friend Matthew wrote to say that he had one when he was a little boy, too. And as he got older, the more in focus she became. In Enfield, Connecticut, when I was young, I had an imaginary friend who wore a colorful outfit and neat jewelry. Years later, I would recognize the style as 70s style clothing. I could see her clearly whenever I spoke to her. Often, I would draw while chatting with her, or sometimes she would read over my shoulder. Her humor was quirky, and she had odd slang. She would tell me knock-knock jokes, love saying things were far out, and any attempt to wish her well would result in a back at ya. These were phrases I totally picked up from her. Over time, I felt like it got more challenging to see her in my mind's eye. It was gradual. I think it took place over a year when I was about 13 or 14. When I was 18 and suffering from depression, I was curious if I could still call on her. I could. I saw her in a dream. She explained that she had died the year I was born, and when I was young, I was in the car when my parents drove past the place she had died, and she said she could feel my presence as a pull. She said she watched over me and spoke to me, as I was one of the few people who could interact with her. She explained that she was going to move on, but would check in from time to time. Every now and then, I feel like I'm being watched and smell sandalwood. I feel like it is her. I can easily write this off as imagination or delusion, but that doesn't change the fact that I do feel the occasional check-in and in the moment, it feels real. In any case, I'm glad I knew her. Funny thing, I caught a whiff of sandalwood after writing this. Wow. <laughs> what a fantastic story. Yes, thank you so much, Matthew. I know everyone likes to definitively label an experience. Is it a ghost? Is it my imagination? Mm, yeah. But really, when it comes down to it, some events can just be so perfectly needed that an explanation isn't the important part. Yeah, I really agree. And the fact that Matthew made the connection to reach out to his ethereal mm. friend after so many years, I think really reveals the impact she had on him when he was growing up mm. and what a good friend she obviously was. Yeah, I'm really glad someone was there for you when you needed them, Matthew. Yeah. Mm. And if you mm. had a very vivid and visible friend while you grew up, dear guest, mm. perhaps these stories will cast it in a new light. And then you'll never sleep again. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. When we return, we'll hear about one family whose ghost really knew how to make himself at home. And we'll meet another family whose raucous reunions demonstrated that they truly always had room for one more. You're listening to Odd Tonic. We'll be right back. So in the meantime, don't let a bad influence set your toys on fire. <laughs> Dear guest, in addition to hearing our velvety voices, hmm. how would you like to see us in the parlor? This is the very first goal we're working towards through Patreon. We work hard to make Odd Tonic a polished audio experience, and we would do the same for our visual experience. Mm. But to make it happen, we need some special equipment for our parlor space. Effective lighting with a small footprint, lav mics so our faces aren't covered by giant <laughs> microphones, uh, a couple more cameras with appropriate lenses. And you can help make it a reality. Support the show and get some spooky rewards in the process by visiting patreon.com slash Odd tonic. And speaking of support, we would love to thank our most recent pledgers at the $10 level. Yay! Todd from Sprue Loose Miniatures. Check out his awesome work at facebook.com slash sprue loose. So amazing. <laughs> and also our mermaid friends, the Salish Sea Sirens, who you can find at salishseasirens.com. At the seashore. <laughs> 
<laughs> support from the gaming and mermaid communities. <laughs> Two of our favorites among the many eclectic circles that make up the odd tonic Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to be thanked by name in an upcoming episode and more, visit us at patreon.com slash odd tonic. Now let's return for more fuel for sleepless nights. Welcome back. So far, we've heard a story about an amazing invisible friend and a terrifying invisible frenemy. <laughs> now let's listen to a submission from Marion. She tells us about a lingering house guest who, despite Marion's yawning and observing how late it was, putting on her pajamas, <laughs> turning out the lights, definitely would not take a hint. We lived in this house for 32 years. It was built in 1904 and is a classic Queen Anne Victorian two-story, which needed a ton of work. The house had a reputation we were unaware of when we bought it. Not that it would have stopped me from buying it, mind you. From the get-go, little things were happening. But I was young, I had a young child, and the last thing on my mind was ghosts. After a while, though, I couldn't ignore things anymore. There are way too many ghost stories I could tell you. Let's just suffice it to say that over the course of 32 years, my kids were very accustomed to living with spirits. Mm -hmm. By now, my middle daughter was 21, my oldest was 28, and was moving out of the house just down the street from us. She had told us that she thought there was a ghost in there, but at the time, I took things she said with a grain of salt. To humor her, I went down there with my K2 meter, voice recorder, and other trappings of the 90s ghost show popularity. <laughs> I did a half-hearted investigation, really not expecting to get much. I even jokingly told whoever was there, hey, if you get bored here when she moves out, you can always come over to my house. Bad idea. Uh -oh. Less than a week later, my middle daughter, Amelia, comes into our room in the middle of the night complaining that someone is messing with her. I told her to pick up her room and all would be solved. One of the resident ghosts in our house was a woman who did not like when the kids would let the rooms go too messy. Wow. The next night, she came into our bedroom actually crying. Now, let it be said that she is not a baby and is used to things happening from time to time. So for her to be this distraught was unusual. A book had leapt off the bookshelf, a candle was knocked off the nightstand, and her heavy 40-pound mirror had jumped from its nail onto the floor. Mm. This is not the woman, Mama. This is someone else. I got my voice recorder, and we both crawled into her bed and eventually fell asleep. The next morning, I got the voice recorder, uploaded everything to my computer, and listened through five hours of data. All was quiet for the first bit until we fell asleep. What I heard after that was astounding. Clear footsteps, shuffling around, knocking, and what we dubbed later as plinking on glass items. But there were also EVPs, many of them. Wake up, wake up, get up, get up. I love you, Amelia. I want to kiss you and a woman's voice coming from farther away saying, He ran me out! This went on for quite a while till you hear the birds start chirping and others in the house start stirring for the day. On a hunch, I went back and listened to the audio taken from my oldest daughter's house. Sure enough, there was talking there as well. The exact same voice. Oh crap, and I had invited him. Oh, no. <laughs> For the next nine months, this ghost terrorized Amelia almost every night. As soon as she would turn off the light, he was there. He would appear as a shadow person right beside her, hovering over her. She said he could make his appearance differ, sometimes resembling a scream mask, but mostly a faceless black mass. 
Her cat would hiss and go tearing off the bed. She still knew he was there with the light on, but at least she couldn't see him. When he couldn't get attention any other way, he would stomp around and move stuff, making noises. Just knowing someone is watching you all the time, especially for a younger person, had to be unnerving. She began sleeping with the light on and being totally embarrassed by that fact. I tried to talk to her, to alleviate her fear and to get her to stand up to him, but it was no use. He focused on her, as she was the only one in the house that feared him. He gained the moniker, Dude, over time. When we were talking about him, it was that dude, and then it became just dude. He affected us all in that time, but none so much as poor Amelia. Let me interject here. In the course of living in this house for so many years, I have never seen a ghost. I felt them touch me, I heard footsteps, and I've heard them singing. I've seen the evidence of things they've moved. I've smelled flowers, bacon cooking, nothing to ever really be frightened of. I've done a ton of research, and to me, what is labeled as paranormal is just the opposite, completely normal. Ghosts are the byproduct of human existence. They were people once, with family, jobs, problems, just like us. I become somewhat of an advocate for spirits, and I try to relay this mindset to my family as well. No one has ever been hurt, so there's nothing to be afraid of, yes? I saw Dude, though. As time went on, the more powerful he became. The more we talked about him, the more puffed up and bold he was. As I would walk through the house, he would cross right in front of me. I saw a blurry red flannel shirt and jeans, no head, no legs or arms. When he entered a room, he would plink on something, like a drinking glass or the shades on the light fixtures. Plink, plink. Hey, dude. He'd make really loud cracking noises sometimes as well, like someone pulling up a wooden yardstick and then letting it smack down. It would always startle us. We could almost imagine him chuckling to himself. When he touched you, it felt like someone was barely taking a feather down your arm. Amelia was getting more and more worn down. I finally contacted a paranormal team to come investigate. Even though I knew it was real, I wanted validation. We got it. They captured some Class A EVPs in a man's southern accent. And honestly, it made things worse. Dude had probably never gotten so much attention in his living life. Mm. I had attempted to talk to him during the day when no one was home, tried to reason with him, again, being the spirit's advocate. He can't be such a bad guy, right? Yeah, he was a smartass and an arrogant one at that. At one point, I had told Amelia that if she wasn't comfortable talking out loud to him to convey her wishes that he'd leave, then write him a note. He'll read it, I said. In an EVP session, I said to him, why would you want to stay somewhere where you aren't wanted? Why don't you just leave? The answer I received was, there ain't nothing you can do about it. (laughs) Okay, time to switch tactics. From then on, we didn't speak to him and tried to completely ignore him. Any conversation of dude or his activities had to be talked about away from the house. By then, I was breaking out the sage, salt, and threats to no avail. Eventually, Amelia couldn't take it anymore and moved out. I was worried he would follow her wherever she went, and for a little while, we didn't really know if he did or not. I should mention here in that time, our nephew came to visit, and I put him in her old room just a week after she left. I didn't tell Justin about Dude at all because, one, I really didn't know if Dude was still here, and, two, Justin would have laughed at the mere mention of something as silly as the idea of a ghost. This kid had done two tours of duty in Afghanistan, mind you. Doesn't scare easily. The second morning he was there, he came down for breakfast, looking a little bit worse for wear, and I asked him if he didn't sleep well. 
He replied that he thought one of Seth's friends, Seth was my youngest child, was messing with him, talking and throwing stuff at the windows and walking around all night. Uh Uh-oh, time for a conversation. (laughs) A long one. Dude stuck around for about two months after that, pestering Seth and my husband and me, but I suppose we were quite boring. I would greet him cheerfully when he came into our room at night. Sometimes we'd still be up watching TV, and I could see his shape outlined clearly standing near the side of the bed. In the corner of my eye, there he was, but when I looked directly at him, he was not. Look back at the TV, there he was. He would, inappropriately, I might add, stroke my leg from my ankle to my knee, and then plink on my glass. We always just yelled at him to knock it off, or laughed at him. Then one day, he just wasn't around anymore. To this day, I have mixed emotions about that. I kind of miss him in a weird way, and I wonder where he went. Things have quieted down here since all my kids have moved out. Occasionally, something pops in, but I deal with it and have since changed my assertion that life with spirits is a romantic notion. Hmm. It's not good for anyone, and even the most well-meaning spirit can have negative impacts on the living. They really shouldn't be here, and while I do have compassion for them, I do everything in my power to get them to move on. I have even gone as far as to open a shop and sell items and give advice to those who are experiencing problems. Welcome to life at the Lytle House. (laughs) (laughs) So great. Ah, And you can check out Marianne's shop on Etsy, dear guest. See the show notes for the link. I know it was hard on Amelia, Mm. but this story was amazing. Yes. Thank you, Marion. Oh, it's such a treat hearing a story from someone who's an old hand with the paranormal. (laughs) Gosh, I love her insightful details. Yeah. And it's interesting how, in this case, Marion had a perception of what the ghostly MOs were. (laughs) But then she had an experience that went completely against that perception, right? Mm -hmm. Proving that while... Some paranormal experiences may be our own consciousness at play. Some definitely seem to be external. Yeah, they'll definitely prove you wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, she said she had romantic notions of ghosts, which I completely relate to. Mm -hmm. I definitely catch myself wanting to call hauntings romantic. Yeah, but this ghost brought a baseball bat (laughs) to that narrative. Good job, dude. You had to ruin everything, (laughs) didn't you? I know. (laughs) A ghost being disruptive? That came out of nowhere. (laughs) Well, our last story comes to us from Matt, whose family reunions are full of disruptions, pranks, and mystery. I grew up in Pennsylvania with a large family, and the word large doesn't quite cover it. I am one of the early arrivals of about 30 first cousins. Wow. My mom had four brothers and my dad had nine brothers and sisters, not to mention all their significant others, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and friends. Most either worked a farm or worked a factory. Family gatherings were one part reunion and two parts hillbilly Budweiser beer fest. <laughs> Pigs were thrown on cinder block roasting pits and Maryland blue crabs were eaten by the bushel. Pranks, arguments, football, and the sober shenanigans were about as bad as the drunken ones. <laughs> I vaguely remember a Halloween party where a whole oak tree caught fire. <laughs> Then there was a time when my Uncle Andy brought 18-year-old me industrial fireworks. No idea where he magicked those from. I remember this one time I was hanging out in one of the barns, and my uncle asked me if I wanted to go swimming. And he legit threw me up and over a semi-trailer wall and into a bed of soybeans. (laughs) I remember the obscene strength of someone who threw 100-pound hay bales for eight hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. On my mom's side, Uncle Richard was the oldest and therefore master of ceremonies for their misdeeds. He was the taller man with a beer belly, black hair and blue eyes, John Deere hat, and a constant smirk. 
On my 18th birthday, he conspired with my dad to buy a big bag of condoms, lube, and various adult magazines. They gave it to me as a present and accidentally Uh. ripped it onto the floor in front of everyone. Oh. I still need to get someone back for that. (laughs) My Uncle Richard would work the fields behind my parents' house and come in for water every few hours. As they were baling straw one early summer day, he knocked on our sliding glass door in the back. I watched my mom answer it while I noticed my uncle's hand was behind his back. When she opened the door, without missing a beat, my uncle goes, Hey, Sue, you ever have plant sex? She had the same, what did you just say expression that you're probably wearing now. (laughs) Then he threw a pile of pollen in her face and ran away laughing. (laughs) He was long gone by the time she knew what hit her. That was a good day. (laughs) Sometime later, again in the summer, my Uncle Richard took a trailer load down to Florida. I think it was a load of potatoes. Regardless, he never came back. I remember the evening I got the news very clearly. It was a midsummer Tuesday. The sun had just finished setting and I was about to drive back to my parents' house from a bike ride. I was hot, sweaty, and smiling. My dad called and told me why they couldn't get a hold of Richard. Heart attack. The Florida coroner said about three days ago, he had just gotten to the panhandle, bedded down for the night, and didn't wake up. Mm. I don't want to think about the mess the cops found in his truck cab. Three days in the Florida heat. Uh. Days before he left, my uncle was complaining about not feeling right. I know it haunts my dad that he didn't drag Richard kicking and screaming into the hospital. Hmm. Anyway, December of the same year, and it was time for the family Christmas party. This year, it was at my aunt's house. I remember it having a somber feel to it. Richard usually dressed up as Santa. Per normal, our gargantuan amount of food was spread out, (laughs) and after we ate, it was time for the Christmas card game. How you play is this. First... Everyone sits in a circle and you pile a bunch of presents in the middle. They're not expensive presents, just stuff. Maybe a few rolls of toilet paper, (laughs) bag of M&Ms, could be a whoopee cushion. (laughs) Who knows? Just cheap stuff. But the point is, there are fewer presents than there are people. Second, like some people do for white elephant parties, you take two decks of cards. Individually, you thoroughly shuffle each deck. The first deck is dealt out one at a time to everyone in the circle. The person holding the second deck then pulls the top card and calls them out, one at a time. If your card is randomly called, you pick a present. You can steal one from someone or take one from the middle. Our game began, with my aunt holding the second deck. She called the card and my cousin picked a present. The next person called was the person to his right, and they picked a present. The next person called was on that person's right. And then... It was me, on their right. When the person to my right was called, the hair stood up on my arm. That was when my aunt picked up on it. And she goes, Wait, is the next one Donna? It was. And it kept going like that. We abandoned the presence and just watched in fascination as the pattern continued. My other aunt screamed a little. Some of us started smiling and laughing. There was this ethereal feeling in that moment, like a quiet, joyful piece of magic. I remember my little cousins looking at each other like, Did you do that? No. Did you? Around and around the cards went, with no one knowing what was going on. All random, but all in sequence, in order and always counterclockwise until all the cards were gone. Wow. Two decks shuffled independently and coming together to make a consistent pattern out of a group of 15 people. I don't have to do the math to tell you that the odds of it happening on its own are low. It's still a family mystery to this day. Did one of the kids stack the deck? Did my aunt do it? All I know for certain is that it makes me think my Uncle Richard had one last prank to pull, and it makes me smile. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. That's terrific. Thank you for your story, Matt. You know, it's funny. When you think of the typical ghost story, you're dealing with an entity you don't know and whose backstory you'll likely never know, yeah. which is completely different compared to a story like this, right. where you know and even love the person making the ghostly appearance. Hmm. And you can get this sense of closure from the encounter. It just mm. seems really nice and rare. Yeah, it is so much nicer than a stranger who insists on opening your kitchen cabinets at 2 a.m. <laughs> or one who threatens to burn down your grandparents' house with you in it. <laughs> Ghost jerks. <laughs> TM. <laughs> Well, that sounds like the final nail in this edition of Odd Tonic. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed our latest ghoulish goings-on sent in from our guests. Do you have a story you can't explain and avoid telling the general public or even <laughs> close friends? Well, that's what Odd Tonic is for. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Yeah. We will giddily read your tale of the unknown and share it with our true-believing, oddling audience. Anonymously, if you wish. You can reach us at the parlor at oddtonicsociety.com. Remember to subscribe so you never miss a show mm. and leave us an iTunes review so other oddlings can find us too. <laughs> we'll be back next week with more weird history, strange science, and paranormal predicaments. This is, dear guest, goodbye for now. But remember, if you're ever reading late at night and your bedroom doorway suddenly erupts into a vision of flickering flames, a maniacal grin, and beckoning arms reaching slowly toward you. Don't worry. It's just us. Good night.